All right. So taking today's agenda forward, uh, next up, we have a panel discussion, uh, which will be focusing on how to foster inclusive knowledge co-production and policy engagement. How can we leverage best practices and practical experiences for strengthening our regional alliance? So for the next hour, what we'll be talking about is largely going to focus on seeking your thoughts and ideas about strengthening alliances and networks to collect best practices and practi uh, practical guidelines for inclusive policy engagement and also to learn about any ongoing strategies to foster gender equality, disability, and social inclusion within our regional alliances. So without any further ado, let me welcome our panelists for this session. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Nin Chanrit, who is the Director for Center for Natural Resources and Environment, CDRI. Can I please invite you to take a seat on the stage, please? Next up, we have Dr. Vijan Simichaya, who is the president of Thailand Environment Institute. So if you can take a seat on the stage, please. Can we have the round of applause going so that we can, you know, keep that energy going while we get into the discussions? Also, next up, we have Dr. Fagde, Samanet co-chair. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nin Pason, uh, Director General, Lao Women's Union. Can we have you on the stage, please? Last but not least, Mr. Nguyen Hong An from Vietnam's Women's Academy. Can we have you on stage, please? All right, so we have all our panelists set in. Okay, can you please join us on stage? Thank you. After you. All right, so thank you so much for joining us on stage and we are now going to get this discussion started. So the first question that I would like to ask all our panelists here today is, what are your experiences with inclusive policy engagement in the Mekong region? So I think we can go in a sequential way, please. It is a very interesting but difficult uh, question. Um, yeah, you know that uh, research is very expensive, uh, time consuming and resource uh, consuming. And doing a regional study is even more I think, resource and time consuming. Furthermore, uh, to make research uh, inclusive, as uh, we discussed right now, is even more expensive. So time and resource um, consuming. Um, but anyway, uh, in Cambodia, uh, CDRI, uh, Cambodia Development Resource Institute, has uh, led uh, a few uh, regional uh, research uh, networks. And today we were pleased uh, to share uh, our experience. Um, in uh, leading and managing uh, these uh, networks. I want to highlight uh, a network uh, that uh, we have been uh, leading called uh, Network for Agriculture and Rural Development Think Tanks for countries in uh, the Mekong region. This is uh, a network um, funded by uh, IFAD and it comprises uh, research think tanks in Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam. So what, what we're doing in this uh, network is that um, uh, we, we want our uh, partner uh, think tanks uh, to do a research, regional research, transboundary uh, focus on inclusive agriculture policy in order to improve the quality of the the quality of the, the policy and strategies in agriculture and, and rural development not not only in uh, individual countries uh, but uh, in in the Mekong region as a whole so we have a regional focus uh, in this uh, in this uh, network 
And the second objective is to facilitate the upscaling of uh, upscaling and institutionalizations of good practices and innovatives in comparable regional contexts. So our rationale is that uh, normally when we do research, we, we do it individually in individual countries for the agriculture policy in Cambodia, agriculture policy in Laos, etc. But within this work, uh, we have a regional focus and we have brought together policy think tanks uh, from uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam to work uh, together in this uh, network. All right, so is it inclusive? Um, <laughs> inclusive um, research? Uh, to some extent, yes. Um, in, in each country, um, our partner uh, has done their research uh, based on participatory consultations with the key stakeholders, especially um, you know the, the, the end uh, users or the uh, ultimate beneficiaries. For example, in Cambodia, uh, we work with um, farmers' organizations, or, or we call them uh, agricultural cooperatives, so in the co-design of the research objectives, but also in you know, ongoing consultations. Um, consultation workshop, validation workshop, and dissemination workshops to, to do uh, our research and, and, and disseminate the findings. So yeah, so this is an example of a regional network uh, that we have been doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chirat. Over to you, Dr. Wijan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's my guest pleasure to be here to share uh, my knowledge and uh, experience, especially for the research. Uh, I myself come from, uh, I uh, used to work with the Pollution Control Department, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, Environment as well. But uh, before that, uh, I work on the laboratory, mostly on the research, water research. And uh, when I see Dr. Chajanit and Dr. Thanapon, uh, we also work together in uh, Mekong uh, River Commission, especially uh, myself uh, as a director of environment uh, tied uh, to inclusive uh, environmental agenda on water management in, in Mekong region. Uh, at the time, we used the, our, uh, uh, our strategy, uh, used modeling uh, to apply for the uh, basin uh, management. Even uh, myself in Thailand, I uh, tried to uh, use the, we call the uh, uh, side uh, uh, base uh, to develop a policy, uh, especially uh, for water quality in the uh, Tajin River Basin in Thailand. Also uh, use the uh, scientific uh, information uh, to uh, develop uh, a modeling Recently, uh, 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 TI, Thailand Environment Institute, non non-profit organization, uh, we also work with the partner, especially for the uh, transboundary problem, uh, plastic pollution, another one, uh, also support by uh, Australian uh, Embassy on the Mekong Hub on the uh, plastic. Uh, recently, our region facing with uh, uh, microplastic contamination. When we are going to uh, stop uh, plastic pollution in the ocean, we have to look for the source of the uh, plastic. And that's the very source, microplastic, uh, right now. Uh, in our tissue, in our heart, also contain uh, microplastic. That's the very important issue uh, for the United Nations. Uh, they're going to uh, uh, develop new agreement similar to the climate change on the uh, uh, protection of marine plastic DB. Uh, that's one. Another example is the transboundary heat pollution for the ASEAN, especially for the Mekong region. Also, another one that uh, we are facing very long period of time, 
I myself also asked, uh, 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 my, I'm not sure how many years ago, I worked with uh, Mekong uh, uh, River uh, uh, region on the, uh, to stop uh, the heat pollution. We set our target. We uh, do some research and uh, 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 let's learn from uh, uh, practitioners on the ground. It is really important and come to research. We set our target. Uh, this year, uh, we are uh, uh, going uh, for the uh, zero burning for the region or something like that, but uh, still not get that uh, uh, target yet. Last year also in the region, we are facing with a really uh, uh, high problem uh, for the uh, transwater heat pollution. Uh, this kind of thing needs the scientific information uh, we have to identify the sort of uh, heat pollution. Uh, we have to use like a technology, like a, a satellite image, even uh, geographic information uh, system need to apply uh, for uh, uh, the region. Uh, we, we also going to handle a new project, uh, still uh, develop uh, with the uh, uh, three uh, country, uh, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, and Lao PDR also, and <laughs> how we uh, try to use our scientific information to uh, develop policy. Here also some, some uh, example of the uh, inclusive policy engagement. I think it's really, really important, especially cyber policy, but uh, how we can uh, translate scientific information to the uh, policy maker. I think it's uh, really important. Uh, somehow policy maker, they, they don't uh, aware of uh, scientific uh, information because uh, what they said is a uh, really complicated one. But uh, in uh, our uh, research uh, side, we have uh, how we can uh, translate to policy maker and also translate to uh, public in general, I think it's really important issue. Uh, network, I think it's really important. We can work together, but some problem, as I mentioned earlier, is time, time's bodily, uh, in nature, like um, uh, plastic, microplastic contamination in, in the sea, or uh, even the uh, time's bodily heat pollution. If they not work together, similar to uh, salmonid, uh, similar to the MTT that we are going to uh, develop and work together uh, by uh, utilize uh, research in the region, I think it's really important that thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijan. And it's good to know that you know things have been progressing for the past couple of de uh, decades, but still there are new challenges coming up and there are new approaches that researchers and policymakers are taking moving forward. Over to you, Dr. Pakde, for your response. Uh, thank you, Vidi. I, I think I will answer this question by actually sharing my own personal experience coming into Summonet about 10 years ago. Um, so I actually first heard about Summonet in 2013 uh, when I was actually working on uh, my PhD, but also at the time I was working for the UN Red program in Asia and Pacific. Um, so at the time there were specific questions that were being asked. Um, and that was actually how do we write the National Red Plus strategy for countries in Asia and Pacific. Um, so that also was my PhD at the time and then uh, working for the UN Red program at the time. Um, I was working on Cambodia, Myanmar and Thailand. And so my advisor at the time who was at the UNDP here in Bangkok was suggesting that maybe I should look into this summer net program that I have never heard about. Um, that there was like a call for a proposal that uh, may be uh, something that I can look into and see maybe we can do something with it in order to try to answer the question that we're actually working on in our workplace, which is helping the countries in the Mekong to draft the National Red Plus Strategy. So then I started to look into um, Summonet, the call proposal at the time, and then was able to put together a team in Cambodia, in Thailand, and in Myanmar. 
um, coming together with this very specific question on how do we write national repast strategy in these countries? And in the process, what actually we can learn from each other. Because at the time, 10 years ago, Red Plus was really new, and a lot of people don't really know what to do with it. Not much guidance is actually coming from the UNFPCC, so a lot is actually with the country to try to do themselves. So then we thought that this is actually a great opportunity. Then uh, we put together a proposal, apply for summon at phase three, and luckily we got the grant and we were able to actually carry out the research. Um, so I think the context that I'm trying to set here is that we are actually coming into this with very specific questions uh, that is actually asked by the government because the government is actually asking the UN Red at the time, how do we draft National Red Plus strategy that has all of these like uh, very technical components? So we decided to that we, we decided at the time that with the summon of support, we will use the grant to look into uh, how to write the National Red Plus strategy, but very much focusing on how do you address the safeguard component, how do you address the revenue sharing or financing of Red Plus, and overall, how do you write the National Red Plus strategy? And we want to use Summonet at the time as a way to try to learn uh, how each of the country is doing this, and then maybe as a way to share lessons. So uh, that's how uh, I, I got involved in Summonet about 10 years ago. Um, in terms of the lessons learned or the experience that we have in this process is that um, I think it's super important that um, when we talk about trying to make the policy impact or trying to have engagement with policy, we should really come from the position of actually with working with the policy people themselves and actually understanding what exactly is the question that they are trying to answer. Um, like the context that I'm trying to set here is that they do have a timeline that the country have to have a national red plus strategy in order to move forward, in order to request the financing. So uh, there is actually really strong interest from the government to actually have a national red plus strategy and then to get whatever support that they can get in order to help them move forward with this. And so it was actually a very good opportunity for us because we have this context to work with and then we jump into it. Uh, and then through the process uh, with the five years that I was leading the research for uh, this topic for summon at phase three, we were able to actually work very closely with the government in the three countries. We were able to produce several things that uh, were actually used, for example, uh, in each of the country because uh, the researchers are uh, from the Royal University of Phnom Penh, uh, Kasesat University here in Bangkok, uh, and then the Yezhen University, uh, the Faculty of Forestry in Myanmar. Uh, we are all actually quite involved with the national processes in this country, so we were able to uh, produce what we call the briefing notes directly for the government using the local language so then it was actually picked up right away. Um, and they are actually discussing these topics during the time so it was very relevant for them to be able to see like what are the different suggestions that we might have uh, for them. Um, we were able to actually write with the government themselves uh, for actually not just like a academic article, but also the summonet book chapter. We also write uh, several briefing for the UNFCCC um, and also the UN Red newsletters, sharing the lessons from the research. So I think my my point here is that with, when it comes to inclusive policy engagement, um, I would actually place the burden on the researcher themselves to really actually immerse themselves in the policy process and understanding what are the priorities that the I don't know, the institution that you're trying to have impact on is really working on and not coming to them and say, okay, this is actually the topic that you should be working with. Well, it might not be actually aligned with what they have in their work plan or whatever the priorities that they have at the time. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Fagde. So it's, it's kind of that we need to follow what's needed, right? So it's going to be a need-based interaction and also that would facilitate more inclusive engagement with those policymakers as well. So thank you so much for your response and over to you, Dr. Ninpasar. Yes, uh, good, good morning or afternoon, I'm not sure. And thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of your uh, really significant uh, consultation and forum today. This is my first time to be a part of your here, but of course I don't have experiences with your project, but since this morning I hear a lot of the inputs and outcomes that you did so far and uh, been uh, complete successfully. But let me share with you, I do hope also from the, this uh, forum, I will apply something to you. 
and uh, I also hope that we will uh, have opportunity to accelerate some uh, gender equality in the, your action plan. And uh, I do think is um, the question that you just raised to us that by the end of this uh, panelist that discussion, we will have something talking about the next step of the GISP and how to accelerate the gender and disabled people in your programs. But uh, so far, the, may I say, share the experiences that I, been ha I have been done with the Love Women Union. Actually, I worked with the Love Women Union almost 29 years old since I was shy. Oh, no, no, single woman. <laughs> so today I have my son and my niece sitting and listen to my talk. Uh, they sit over there. They are not the participants, but I asked the organizing committee, please allow my kids to listen to 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 my talk and that they will build some inspiration for them in the future but they're still in the school seven not yet complete but okay and then uh, we have the uh, love women union is a nationwide and naturally we are the ministry of women affairs in laos and of course talking about the policy allegiance in this world uh, for instance the climate change for the gender equality and etc for instance, that in Laos right now, we are engaged with the UN party, especially the CEDO, and when we're talking about the women and gender equality, and also climate change, we are playing attention on DR number 37. And we also play a crucial role in terms of implementing the Paris Declaration, especially the article number six and number seven, that on the state, uh, uh, on the state and government should consider about how to improve the status and empower women in the society. And also, uh, we also the member of the UNFCCC. I am the focal point for the gender equality in Laos, maybe the, for the COP28. We will ask the Mekong committee here to support all of us here to go to COP28 in Dubai, coming next uh, in December 8 to 11. And uh, this one, we are commit a lot on the gender equality and also the, we are, the also work uh, very closely with the group of the adaptation and resilience on climate change. And Love Women Union itself right now, we are successfully in comply and uh, uh, successfully apply the projects on the how to support the rural women in wash and sanitation using and safe water. And we also are doing the leashes that uh, we will talk about uh, uh, how does the water and sanitation impact on the women before and after disaster as well. This one we call the climate change and resilience adaptation. And another work that we have here, we also uh, uh, we, we will be the party very soon with the Mekong Lan Sang uh, through China Fund that allows Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. But this term is Cambodia is the host. They're going to give the not too big grant, about 50,000 US dollars to my department to run the programs on how to assess the gender climate change and water sanitation. And we will have it soon. And I do things also, another, the, another thing that's really important that we will work together because Mekong is uh, our resources. When we talk about the water consumption, when we're talking about the population in Mekong, the female already engaged about 50%. If you left female behind, it means that your program doesn't successfully 100%. This is our leader focus on the time. Gender equality, something is really uh, difficult to touch because you try to change the way of thinking of the people and plus the climate change. Climate change is daily, but it's a more difficult this because the gender could not touch, climate change could not change any things, but you combine two subjects together, therefore we need to have a really big hand and working together. Thank you, this is for my first question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your inspirational journey of around three decades on how you are taking this agenda forward. So we are very happy to hear that from you. Over to you, Ms. Nguyen. Thank you uh, for 
giving me uh, an opportunity to uh, share some of uh, our experience uh, in this uh, conference. Uh, I prepare some uh, uh, something to share with uh, all of you, but uh, I uh, listened to many uh, uh, experience from uh, the other countries very good. So I think uh, now I, uh, I share with uh, you um, uh, one thing I am uh, very uh, um, satisfied uh, about uh, uh, Vietnam Women's Union. Uh, as you know, Vietnam Women's Union is a social political organization in Vietnam, and we have a strong, uh, um, um, strong um, network and uh, um, statement statement in Vietnam. Uh, so I uh, would like to share about uh, a special uh, experience. Um, Vietnam government uh, uh, built a national target a program uh, on the, um, social political develop, uh, development in uh, uh, my, uh, minority uh, marginalized area. But uh, the first time, uh, there are nine, there are include nine projects on um, various uh, uh, areas, such as uh, cultural, uh, education, uh, health, uh, health care, and um, many things, but uh, without gender component. And Vietnam Women's Union uh, uh, had to uh, I want to use the word fighting to uh, organize uh, to a government uh, uh, government member to uh, include uh, one uh, one component is uh, gender equality in this uh, national target program, and um, after two years to uh, advocate to lobby uh, such a and uh, the government and the national uh, assembly um, asked uh, Vietnam Women's Union to implement uh, an independent component on uh, answering uh, gender equality in the, the national target uh, program. Uh, so now we have a function to uh, implement uh, um, gender uh, equality and uh, seeking, seeking uh, solutions to uh, um, necessary uh, issues of women and children. And we have uh, another function to uh, monitor and uh, um, evaluate uh, gender uh, integration into all activity projects of other ministries. Um, so I think the gender uh, equality uh, is uh, very uh, important included in the national target, uh, um, national target uh, programs. So I think um, if uh, our the network um, developed uh, many projects and uh, proposal. Uh, it uh, should be uh, should be include a gender component into uh, our um, proposal. So I, I think because I I prepare many things, but um, I I don't want to um, talk again. Um, something um, our uh, college uh, raise opinions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are happy to hear what has been, you know, going on in Vietnam and how uh, we are uh, motivating or, you know, trying to bring a change in the way things are happening in Vietnam, especially with respect to gender inclusion. So now we've heard from all our panelists and how they have been engaging with, uh, you know, different stakeholders in the region, how they have been uh, involved in this uh, engagement process. So my next question would be to our panelists from CDRI and TEI specifically. 
uh, for um, us to know how this regional alliance can help strengthen the influence of existing networks or work you are currently involved with. Also, there's a second part to the question. Any possibility for regional alliance to cooperate in supporting, particularly if we want to involve young professionals? So first, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Chindra to please uh, respond to the question. Um, thank you very much. Um... So since since uh, we are discussing um, a Nexus Alliance, Alliance and that uh, focus on the Nexus of uh, water, energy, and climate uh, issues in the Mekong region, I, I want to talk about it a little bit and how it can be linked to our existing work uh, networks um, that uh, we are doing or uh, leading. Um, Actually, we have a real nexus in this room. This room is freezing, very cold to me. <laughs> and they gave us cold water. And outside the climate is hot. So, so it's a real nexus actually in this room. Um, so how can such a nexus alliance uh, have strengthened the influence of our uh, uh, existing networks? Um, we 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 just uh, completed um, a regional uh, research uh, consortium, uh, not not a network, but it's a regional consortium on water diplomacy, uh, funded by the the Mekong Lan Chang uh, Corporation Fund. So we had uh, partners from Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Laos, but they did drop, um, and Thailand. Um, so in this uh, research um, you know, consortium, um, we focus on the, 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 the concept and principles of water diplomacy uh, apply uh, within the Mekong region. But um, we just focus on water related issues only. Um, for example, uh, in Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, we we examine uh, policy and, and, and institutions that work uh, on water-related conflict resolutions, uh, including uh, the, the MRC, the Mekong River Commission, and our uh, national uh, 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 Mekong committees um, in, in, in each uh, country. But also we also, uh, we discuss um, impacts of hydropower dams on uh, local communities uh, upstream and, and downstream. Um, so we just completed uh, this this uh, regional um, study uh, cons consortium, uh, but uh, we, we are not finished. We we are still in in touch, and uh, we we still in discussion on. A, a emerging opportunities, how we could work together again. So I think um, a regional alliance like this, like ours, uh, that uh, focus on the nexus of water, climate, and energy could help us find opportunities to work on the, the linkages of the issues. Um, as I said, we just focus on hydropower dams in, in our uh, work. But I think maybe uh, a Nexus network like ours could help us, uh, you know, uh, bridge, you know, discussions on to find uh, emerging opportunities to work on, uh, you know, the interconnected uh, issues of water, climate, energy. For example, um, we know that uh, hydropower dams uh, are also impacted by climate change, right? So how how can we we find out, or how can we discuss if our hydropower dams uh, built in the Mekong region could be more climate resilient? For the, yeah, if if they are more climate resilient, uh, we believe. Uh, their operations uh, could be less harmful, for example, to local communities, right? 
so something like this um you know the 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 multiple and sometimes conflicting uses of water by dams and by local communities and how climate change uh, impacts you know not only on uh, local communities but also on uh, the, the the builders of the dams the operators of the dams so if we could bring uh, you know different stakeholders regarding hydropower dams together to discuss um, climate resilience i don't know how to reduce the impact of climate change on uh, dams uh, building construction and operation how they could work local community with local communities to to discuss um, uh, climate resilience uh, not only on their livelihoods but also on uh, the operations of dams you know, to to mitigate uh, harmful impacts on different stakeholders so such an excess alliance would help us uh, find new ways to to discuss emerging issues regarding nexus and to uh, accelerate our influence in the Mekong region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Vijay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we, we have to look for uh, existing uh, alliance or uh, uh, existing research uh, topic, what uh, they have done uh, so far in our region. I uh, would like to give you some ex example uh, for Thailand. Uh, uh, right now, uh, we keep a very uh, important issue on develop uh, of the hub of knowledge, hub of talents. Hub of knowledge is mean uh, we have uh, enough knowledge to share with other uh, country, with other uh, university. And hub of talent is mean uh, experts have to come together, uh, develop some uh, issue or some uh, subject need to uh, uh, do research more. Uh, uh, the government uh, spent more 100 million baht for this year uh, to uh, develop hub of knowledge and hub of talents uh, for for the country and work closely with the uh, librarian country in the Mekong uh, region uh, as well. Uh, I myself also taking care of the hub of knowledge and hub of talent related to the uh, uh, environmental issue, the climate change, biodiversity. They have uh, already support one of hub of uh, uh, knowledge on the uh, biodiversity in the Mekong region uh, that uh, initiated by the professor from Chulalongkorn University. And he going to work uh, closely with the uh, university in the uh, Mekong uh, region. Uh, that kind of thing, how uh, our uh, project uh, can uh, cooperate uh, that kind of thing. I think it's really Im important uh, issue. There are a lot of uh, uh, research, there are a lot of in information going on in the Mekong region. Uh, how we, in even uh, Thailand uh, research council that I, I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. One more point, uh, our country also uh, set our target for the climate change uh, net zero by the year 2065, carbon neutrality by the year 2050. Uh, we have to to get there. How we uh, we to, uh, uh, how we get there? I think it's very really important. Uh, we, uh, right now, on the process of uh, develop the uh, action plan for mitigation, action plan for uh, adaptation. Uh, next us uh, water uh, energy especially you mentioned about uh, uh, hydropower hydropower is the sort of energy that uh, produce less uh, carbon emission but how uh, we uh, look for the climate change look for water look for energy uh, to get the uh, i uh, already talked uh, yesterday uh, the agency uh, 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 taking care of uh, energy, they also look for the one dimension of energy. The uh, agency taking care of water, they even look for the water, for water environment is the come at last. Uh, they look for the development first, how 
uh, we call the integrated sustainable development, how to balance social, economic, and environment. I think it uh, is a really important issue. Uh, for the regional research, uh, I would suggest we have to look for three pillar or three dimension cover uh, social, economic, and uh, environment uh, as well. Uh, for the uh, young uh, uh, generation, Thailand also, uh, right now we have committee uh, to support uh, young generation. We call youth, uh, uh, youth in charge uh, committee. Youth in charge is mean uh, youth in charge of our new agenda, new national agenda, BCG. B stands for uh, bioeconomy, C stands for circular economy, and green stands for uh, green economy. And linked to the uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, uh, uh, we have the committee, co the committee comprised of the uh, representative from the youth, uh, uh, from uh, various uh, sector in, in the country to share uh, their uh, knowledge, especially uh, we talk about uh, the climate change. Climate change is the long-term commitment that going to impact to the youth that uh, uh, currently uh, people already commit some, something, but what happened in the future is really uh, important. Uh, youth have to in charge at the early stage of the, the commitment, action, adaptation is also really important for, for the uh, climate, uh, water, uh, energy as well. That's, that's the uh, kind of thing that uh, uh, we are have done in uh, our country and uh, uh, our region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Virjan. So I'll quickly recap first and then we'll pass it to Dr. Fagde. So it's, it's basically that we have to come up with some unified vision. We have to identify commonalities where we want to be, how to take into account different aspects, different approaches, and then build something which takes into account all water, energy, uh, climate uh, moving forward. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Since we are running short of time, Dr. Fagde, if you can keep it short and sweet. Over just to very you. quickly, I actually just wanted to answer this question from the perspective of Samanat, because I would like to share what Samanat would like to answer this question as a show chair. Um, I think I'm trying to answer this question from the perspective of the MTT that is coming up, but also the existing Samanat that we have had. And as mentioned at the beginning that someone that has been in the region for 18 years. So trying to answer this question from that perspective, I think I would like to highlight four areas. Um, the first one, I think uh, Dr. Luis mentioned already that I think we still need to understand the synergies and the complementarities between the two, because to be honest, um, myself and I assume a lot of the members in the summer that still have not so much idea in terms of what MTT is trying to do. And so I think we still are trying in the face of trying to understand like uh, where are the synergies, where are the complementarities between the two programs, for example. Um, and then the second point is, I think there is a need to actually establish clear expectation between the two programs. I think it's good to talk about like, how do we strengthen each other, but uh, first after understanding if there is even synergies between the two programs, we also have to talk about expectations. Um, what do someone expect from MTT? What is MTT expecting from someone that I think that needs a discussion. Um, and then the third point, I think I would like to highlight this. There needs to be some sort of a positive feedback between the alliance, between the network. Uh, I don't know what that positive feedback would look like, but I think it's important to discuss like how do the two actually reinforce each other. That's what I'm trying to say with the positive feedback. And then the last point I would like to make from Samanet would be, I think we need to identify also what are the proper collaboration tools between the network and the alliance, because um, I think this is an example of that collaboration tool, but I think it has to go deeper than this. Um, so in short, I feel like from Samanet perspective, we need to have a bit more engagement with MTT so that we understand a little bit better the synergy, complementarities, uh, we understand a bit better what are the expectations, and we understand a bit better in terms of uh, how do we reinforce each other? And finally, how do we work together? What are the uh, tools that we can use in order to collaborate? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for that. I think it, it's 
it's somehow directing us where we want to move from here as well and how to keep the dialogue on between different networks and alliances in the region as well. So since we are short of time, I'm going to ask the next question and would request our panelists to please respond in around 30 seconds if possible so that we can have some questions from the floor as well. So my next question would be uh, to Dr. Ninpasen. Uh, it's how can your network collaborate with the proposed regional alliance to achieve common goals? Your reactions and response to it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think yes, there are two main points that I would like to answer. First one, we should think about the, the ASEAN scope first, and then the next is we talk about the Mekong scope. Uh, for the ASEAN scope, if, if you do, are familiar with the ASEAN Committee on Women, and this year, luckily, we are the chairperson of the ASEAN Committee on Women or ACW. And this week, next week, we will hand it over to the uh, Malaysia. But Malaysia will have the big election. But whatever in the plan of the action from now to the 25, they have a really clear pictures on the how to support the climate change and resilience adaptations, especially we talk about not only the disaster flooding, but also the how to adopt it and mitigate that. And if you have opportunity, please look at the ASEAN framework, especially the under article number three, they're talking about gender accelerated in the climate change and resilience. It is, they have the, a very good, clear and very clear statement among that. And the second thing is uh, talking about how the way forward for the, uh, the uh, moving forward for the uh, really good network collaborations in terms of accelerated gender and disabled people. From my observations, I have three things that in my mind. One, we should have a strategic environment impact assessment. That one this morning we already heard from the very really good input of the of your resources and uh, assessment, but unfortunately we don't have any single show about the gender equality. And I know that the question is coming up from our speaker or, or from the floor. And second thing is that we should have the study on the data, gender run study, especially we will focus on the gender or vulnerable groups. Vulnerable groups, we include the poor people, include the disabled and vulnerable group of the people and also ethnics and that one. And the most important thing here, we should have the desegregated data from the beginning. Because desegregated data or gender responsive planning is very important from your plan of action. You put it from the beginning and then you will see the input later. But if you don't consider now, it might be difficult for us to, to make a, a really outstanding uh, evidence. And my third is, I think it's really important. We should have a really clear picture on map identification, what the country needs. For instance, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and other country, we need differently from the uh, interest uh, of using the Mekong or we are the partnership or networking. So different country has a different potential, but not the same things that we need. So for instance, Laos, what do we need? Myanmar and uh, maybe Thailand will really reach among the region here. And especially you have the uh, really good uh, uh, networking and uh, your government will really reach, have a lot of money. Laos, Vietnam and Cambodia be still in the step of doing that, but Vietnam better than us. But Cambodia and me, maybe Cambodia faster, but Laos still behind, something like this. Therefore, we need to have a really clear map of identification of the need of the country. And the next is a vision also consider about the how to we have a good direction. So where we do go, where we gonna to go? Because in strategy, you have long-term, short-term, and immediately. Sometimes some work, especially about the climate change, gender, water, sanitation, and energy, you could not success immediately. And we, we, we can put it in long-term input. Therefore, we should have a really clear direction. And don't forget the gender accessibility in all programs. 
And I think it's a measurable. The next one is uh, we should have a specific uh, measurable indicators and the cone activity. This morning, we hear very clear about your cone, but not clear yet. Well, activity, how many, uh, what, uh, how many activity every country will have? And of course, it's uh, depend on your application successfully, but sometimes you can, uh, you can put a really good direction. Where shall we go? Because consensus, we have the five countries in the Mekong, we will have the same data. Because data is very expensive and information very expensive and research also super expensive. Why? Because in the final of the research, it's very value on a recommendation. That one, everybody will use the recommendation to fill it up in the plan of action in the future. Therefore, I admire that I noted that this is really important and value. And the next is, uh, I do think it's really important, two main things that we should consider about uh, when we talk about the gender and climate change resilience, adaptation, mitigation, we should think about uh, how to avoid on the kinds of the, on types of the violence against women. And also how to empower mini economic empowerment on women, because uh, we could not talk about the big empowerment, a uh, big uh, economic empowerment, but the majority of women are engaged with the SME and talking about the water, talking about energy and climate change is a uh, woman can contribute a, a little bit, but don't forget the women are the half of the population in this world. So therefore, it is a very uh, important and key messages that you support to put over there. And the last point, we should consider some, because this morning the expert doctor thing are talking about how to uh, integrate the economic empowerment on how. Therefore, in here, we should think about for the first is about the dense descent work for the women. And we sh it should be divided in two parts. One is we talk about the care work. Care work, you could not have the value of money, but the contribution. Another thing is the empower. You can uh, provide any types of the financial support without the big interest or just create the microcredit in the place and et cetera. Because climate change, water work is a very big deal. And... Uh, uh, the most important is the final point of mine is that we should have the step-by-step -step leashes because leashes you could not keep it up. Uh, information after three years, you could not use this because it's not relevant already. And therefore, the leashes in the specific uh, uh, teams that we need to carry on and we need to put it in a uh, very specifically. And the final point is uh, talking about the disable is the rune because Australia government not only support the Mekong region, but uh, they also support another programs like Laos. Right now, I am the leader for the parenting programs. Parenting program is a VR are teaching the parents on the community or around the country. So this year I successful in doing work more than 600 villages around the country. And last year I success in 252 uh, parenting programs. We have the indicators about the gender, about violence against women, about how to be a really good health on the women, how to use water and sanitation, how to avoid the people to, uh, to uh, violence against the disabled people and etc. This one we we have a very really good successfully. And please uh, come back if do you remember on stage here, especially the Mekong country, we engage with the international conventions on the human human rights, uh, human with the uh, human with the disabled people at UNSCR, something like this. So thank you very much. This is uh, my experiences I would like to share with you, but I do hope in the future, if I successful in the Mekong application, a uh, project submission, I will, I will have a more experience like the uh, Dr. Tin uh, sitting next to me or Ting Nguyen. No? And then because this year, Laos, uh, no Lao Women Union, we don't have any single with you yet, uh, any single project with you yet. But I do think that I will do up the uh, 
apply the project proposal with you and receive some initiatives and small grant from the Mekong or Somerset. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for sharing your viewpoints and how um, you also highlighted some of the key points, the key strategies that can be taken up to include uh, gender and also disability and social inclusion when we are designing our programs, what stages to consider. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your experiences and also guidances and directions on these lines. So um, without you know, waiting anymore, I would now like to open the floor to our very intrigued audience if they have any questions to any of our panelists. So any questions, you can raise hands. All right, I see one hand there. Nan, can you pass the mic, please? Please uh, let us know your name, uh, your affiliation, and then your question. And please let us know who uh, are you asking this question to. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sangravi Suvirakan. Uh, I'm from Upper Cook River Basin. Uh, thanks for WWF and SEI that uh, let me join this uh, meeting. Yeah, I, I would like to know uh, from all this, the, the speaker, um, according to my experience, I have been have chance to attend the, the meeting, uh, some meeting and uh, on environment issue. And I see that almost that there are no representative from indigenous people and the community who are affected from the development project. And um, yeah, I would like to know from uh, all the speaker that uh, how the indigenous people involved in the discussion uh, platform and decision uh, platform, uh, how uh, any, especially from Thailand. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Any of our panelists would want to react. I see Dr. Vijayan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, Dr. Shayan, it uh, should uh, maybe add more. Uh, for for Thailand, uh, the development project all, uh, already includes the opinion from uh, indigenous uh, uh, people. Uh, for uh, our project, for example, uh, we uh, uh, except the gender issue, we also look for the uh, indigenous uh, uh, people, even the uh, uh, civil society. Uh, right now, we got the uh, sponsorship from uh, uh, government uh, via the, I can't remember the name in English, so, 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 uh, uh, support us uh, for uh, develop network of the uh, civil society uh, in the country. Uh, right now, we have all together uh, around 50 uh, civil society organization uh, around the country work together how we can work balance uh, between uh, our work, uh, some uh, organization taking care of environment uh, issue, uh, some organization taking care of uh, uh, indigenous people, and we come together to share uh, our uh, knowledge, our experience, and to balance uh, uh, the uh, how we can happy with uh, our work, uh, with our life. This is the uh, the project that we are uh, working on, and some project, especially the project we call success, uh, uh, support by uh, European uh, community. Also, we work uh, on the uh, climate resilience at the community on the ground. Work together. We have to listen uh, from them, especially they uh, 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 really. Uh, close to the uh, environment and uh, they're going to impact, especially for the uh, climate change, we have to uh, listen from them and uh, develop uh, a policy uh, uh, submit to the uh, government. That, that uh, kind of thing, even the uh, environmental impact assessment right now uh, in uh, Thailand, uh, even they uh, have some project uh, in the like uh, mountainous area, 
they have to uh, taking care of uh, indigenous people uh, as well that uh, already incorporate with the uh, uh, Thai uh, agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijan, for responding to this question. Uh, Pika, you have something to add? Uh, Nan, can you find? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. So I think that's really excellent question. So how we can really make sure that we consider the voice and really reflecting the need of people who actually affecting from any projects, whether it's uh, supposed to be really helping them or supposed to be helping others. But um, we actually consider this seriously. And I would say that when it comes to engagement with um, indigenous people and my, any minority and others, we really need to see on how, uh, how to say is the, the activity that is really suitable and also the activity that they feel comfortable to engage. And I want to highlight, actually there are several uh, examples, but maybe one of the examples that we uh, completed earlier uh, is through the research project, research for policy and practice that really help uh, improving their uh, local uh, livelihoods, uh, especially linking with uh, hydropower development and resettlement earlier. And I feel very happy today we have our Dr. Utai being with us here. Dr. Utai working closely with uh, other uh, research team members uh, from Tuolongkorn University. Dr. Utai is from Laos. And then we also have Ajahn Carl Biddington and Ajahn, um, uh, I think Ajahn Kanokwan also, so others, and also I think that we have Ajahn Kian. So three countries working on addressing uh, the issue linking with uh, hydropower, linking with the wetland, resettlement earlier. And I'm really proud to really invite Ajahn will try to talk about how your project engaged with indigenous people and what are the impact on the results at the end. Good morning. My name is uh, Ajahn Utai from Northern Agriculture and Forestry College. Uh, this morning, I really appreciate when you are talking about the water energy and the climate change. So actually, our research that we have uh, uh, boundary partner with Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. But we focus on the indigenous people uh, because before we conduct our research, we also conduct the scoping survey because we just thinking that the summonate one day we win, they win finish. So that how to continue by themselves so that we have to think about what existing uh, activity that the farmer have and the experience that the farmer have so that it allows from the recover uh, project from the hydropower so that we uh, focus on the organic uh, rice uh, production. So that the activity that we engage with the farmer, we just uh, uh, study what the farmer experience, what the knowledge and the uh, participation and responsible from the farmer. So that the outcome of our project is really significant change because not only the organic uh, rye farming and also the mushroom and in order animal racing that we are integrated to those uh, our project. And the outcome uh, from now, the farmer, they still continue from our uh, organic uh, rye production. This is the product from the summonate uh, phase, three, phase three. And also I, uh, when I attend this uh, uh, meeting, I would like to share some experiences uh, from uh, Dr. Nin Basert from Lao Women Union. Nowadays, the Lao women try also encourage and uh, to hear the voice of the researcher, because now the GCA, the name, the full name is they, they call Green Community Alliance. They organize the national dialogue before the national assembly start. So that did the outcome of the researcher from different uh, fields, from different aspects. We will invite the ministry uh, that uh, related to the, our research so that this uh, the research will be reflect to the 
uh, national assembly so that uh, I, I see the importance of the transition before in Laos, uh, we don't have such kind of the national dialogue. So that is the void from the researcher can be reflect something before the national assembly uh, uh, open start. So that, and one thing that uh, from the uh, prime minister and the ministry, they also really emphasize that on the researcher, on the research outcome should be application and useful. So that uh, as uh, Dr. Nin Pasert, she addressed this morning, now our country try to open and to receive the void from our researcher. So that is the kind of the uh, uh, transition, is the positive transition. So I think it's my uh, contribution and I really happy to come back and to listen and to contribute to this meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tai. Um just to add also, uh, as part of our uh, intention to be much more inclusive, and although this is not yet being uh, articulated very well yet into the design, but I can't imagine MTT and Summernet to be not be uh, advised by two important principles on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which are in the first one is the right to self-determination, and the second one is free prior informed consent on activities that we're going to undertake. So I'm sure, I don't think there's any intention at all to, to go against this key basic principles on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you very much. Thanks, Albert. Thanks for adding and raising that while we are uh, you know, taking studies and developing this alliance and program ahead. So without... Uh, waiting anymore. I would like to ask my colleagues if we have any questions from online audience. Okay, not any questions from online audience. Anyone else here wants to ask a question? We can just have one more question accommodated before we break for lunch. Thanks, Albert, for passing the mic. Again, if you can just introduce yourself quickly and who are you addressing your question to? Which of the panelists you want to respond? Good Thanks afternoon, so everyone. My name is Mile. I'm a freelance journalist uh, based in Vietnam. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll, I'll try to keep my question short. So please, lunch will come. Uh, so my question is, is that we're talking about um, how to create, uh, how to co-create knowledge uh, in terms of um, collaboration between uh, uh, countries, but my question um, is that uh, how can the regional alliance uh, do to promote inclusiveness in uh, the member country? All right, is that clear? Yes, thanks. Thanks for your question. I'll just check with our panelists, anyone who wants to respond. All right, Dr. Fagde, please yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I think I would just ask back the question when you asked inclusive what what exactly do you mean by inclusive and who are we trying to include i think that's also a clarification first um can i just intervene so dr fakte is asking how do you define inclusiveness and which aspects of inclusiveness are you talking about that should be catered to through co-creation of knowledge Wait. if you can expand on that and then you can yes. provide an answer to your question maybe also just to add do you mean inclusiveness in terms of like uh, having gender perspective having indigenous people considerations like uh, are, are you referring to that kind of inclusiveness yeah so um so my concerns is that how can we um uh we uh can how how can we uh promote um the the local people uh, to raise their voice about their benefits and, and their concern, and that um, that knowledge can can be delivered to uh, the 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 bigger scale, uh, the the bigger alliance. Yep, I, I fully got the question. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I think I would just answer that just based on uh, how we have been working with uh, Summonet specifically with the support from CEDA. 
I think the example I'd like to use would be the fact that in CEDA funded projects or through the SummerNet uh, projects, there is a really big focus on gender inclusiveness, but also the human rights based approach to the different projects that have been getting the support from CEDA in order to implement. I think that for us is a very good starting point because, uh, for example, speaking from my own personal experience with uh, summon at phase three when I was trying to implement the project in, in Cambodia and uh, Thailand and Myanmar and having to actually consider this uh, I would say requirement from CEDA, uh, how, how is my project is actually addressing the human right base, but also the gender sensitivity in its design and implementation. Um, for us, the experience was that it actually did take a lot of uh, learning and we appreciated the trainings that were given by uh, Summonet at the time uh, through the different resource person and actually explaining what it actually means, the, the human rights based approach, the gender sensitivities and all that kind of thing. Um, so the answer I'm trying to get is that I think, yes, it has to come also from the requirement from the, the donor or the funder that is actually giving support to the project. I think if it's not even asked by the funder, then why are we addressing it? Um, because these things actually take uh, resources and efforts and time. So if it is actually in the requirement of the, of the uh, call for proposal, then it is actually the responsibility for the researcher to actually make sure that we address this in a way that is consistent with uh, the guideline or the guidance that we receive from, for example, like a CEDA uh, requirement. Um, and the other point I'd like to make is that um, these things, it's not easy to address and that it does take a lot of uh, support. That's why I think earlier when I was asking questions uh, to MTT is that, um, when we talk about co-production of knowledge, inclusiveness, and also that kind of thing, how is actually that built into the call for proposal? Are you actually allowing resources for researchers to actually address these questions and not just having it as a, a burden, I would say, without the resources to actually make it happen? Um, maybe I'm a bit long-winded here, but I'm just trying to say that, yes, two things. First, it has to come from the requirement for the project to be funded, but also are there actually sufficient support from the funder in order for the researcher to be able to uh, take all of these inclusiveness questions into account and also actually report on it? Um, I think uh, when I was doing the reporting for Cheyanis at the time, as a researcher, we always have to answer all of these questions, like how are we addressing the gender sensitivity questions, but also the uh, human rights based approach. So it has to be also built into the reporting that is required by the, the funder. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. Like, um, uh, thank you. I just uh, want to have a quick response to uh, the question. I think it's very... Uh very uh, in, uh, a good question. Um, inclusiveness is uh, catchy, but also uh, controversial. Um, if if we want to discuss uh, inclusiveness in research, uh, I think we need to ask uh, three questions at least. Who, who do we include? And how many of them? And how do we include? So, um, the targets and the process are equally important uh, in our research um, based on our experience. Whether inclusiveness is like a um, requirement, uh, a mandate, or is it a true, you know, uh, inclusion or co-option? Um, so that's why the three questions are very important, whether our research is really participatory or maybe it's exploitative, you know, extract information and data from uh, the people that we, we, we are asking. So who we include is very important depending on uh, our research objectives and how many of them, whether we include a few representatives or they could be elites in their, you know, in their groups. So it could be not representative. So we need to be careful with this and how the process itself is quite important. As our colleagues here mentioned, do we have any uh, grassroots or indigenous organization in our network or not, in our alliance or not? And who represents them is also important. And how, you know, do they want to engage with us, not how we want them to engage with us. And it's also important. 
And regarding uh, knowledge, co-production is also quite important. When they can engage with us, is it just only through consultation, through a validation or disseminated workshops, or do we engage them from the start of the research design? It's also important. So we need to include these uh, criteria uh, in, in, in uh, our work. So based on our uh, experience, um, and we mentioned we work on um, uh, inclusive agricultural policy. In Camden, we focus on farmer organization or, or agricultural cooperatives. And we focus on uh, public, private, and, and, and uh, partnerships. Um, so we, we work with uh, uh, farmer organization, including uh, indigenous uh, organization working in contract farming especially in a uh, rubber uh, plantation throughout the research process so from the design of the, the research questions and how they could in, you know, contribute to uh, the, you know, the, 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 the discussion of findings based on their local knowledge. So we have different sources of uh, data. So we include their local knowledge and their local idea their their empirical experiences in 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 their work but also other different sources of data from uh, other uh, stakeholders and etc so thanks a lot thank you thank you so much dr chandra so i think we can keep the conversation going and uh, i apologize that we are already a little behind schedule because of the interactions that we had and the detailed responses that our panelists had to the questions that were framed for this panel so if you can join me in thanking our panelists for the first panel for in in engaging session and for you know interacting with our audience thank you so much it was a pleasure to have you